and we'll try at the beginning, first couple of, well, one and a half hour, we will, I will try to give you an introduction to GenFOM theory, practice. Um, the rest of the day we will try to do some hands-on, um, see where we can get. Um, the very first part is about theory. Um, I will try to be short on that. Um, there are probably more slides than I can present, but the idea is to then give you the slides. Uh, this will give you um, keywords, references, things that can be useful for you in the future if you want to start using the tool. So it's normal if I skip some slides, the idea is to give you more material than I can present today. Um, this is something I already showed you, and the main reason I'm showing it again is to say that GenFOAM is not born from scratch. It was born from the activities from PBMR, from the activity on MSRs in Europe, from activities on sodium fast reactors. Um, somehow, a lucky coincidence in 2014, um, four of us working on these different tools were on the same place in the same time, and we decided to create GenFOAM. Um, so it was born from the legacy of 10 years of uh, developments that were done in between 2000 and 2005 and 2015. <coughs> um, it has been developed since 2014, mainly in Switzerland, EPFL, PSI, but we started having a lot of contributions from various institutions. For instance, the Joint Diffusion Solver has been developed at UC Berkeley. Uh, there has been work done in Cambridge. Um, pretty much what we do is that every time someone does a contribution, we acknowledge it in the header file of the class that has been added. So it's slowly transitioning from an um, institution-centric institution uh, tool to a community-driven tool. There are more and more contributions from the community. We are thinking about changing a little bit the governance, going in the direction of what OpenMC people do. Um, but it's a bit of a slow process. Um, it originally it was developed to complement legacy tools. Um, the very first reason we developed GenFOAM 4 was sodium fast reactors. And the reason is that we needed to investigate, I was working at that time in a fast reactor group at PSI and we needed to complement tools like PARKs with capabilities like, for instance, a simulation of the flowering of a sodium fast reactor. Um, you can understand when you want to simulate that, you have to have an unstructured mesh. You have to be able to move your mesh. These are capabilities that typically are not provided in legacy tools. We also wanted to simulate things like um, assembly windows in sodium fast reactors for the stabilization of boiling. Once again, you have to have some specific capabilities. So the idea was, let's try to create something that is more flexible. Um, again, if you go back 10 years, that was not obvious. I mean, 10 years ago, most of the work was done with tools that are legacy tools, structured meshes, very restrictive in the way you can do things. Um, it's been distributed. Initially, we kept it open source, but you know, distribution via mailing list, uh, then we just, once we realized it was ready enough for a broader distribution, we put it on GitLab and now it's open. You just can Google GenFOAM GitLab and you will find it. Um, status, uh, I consider it stable code now. I would say we are in the alpha phase of distribution. In terms of verification and validation is mostly verified. Uh, validation is ongoing, it will always be ongoing. It's a never ending process. We have some reasonable documentation now. We have a Doxygen. Um, I will show you later what I mean. For those of you who, doesn't know, who don't know what Doxygen is, uh, it's a very flexible code. You can model things from you know, molten salt reactor experiment to flowering sodium fast reactor to strange reactors like the Argonaut. Uh, we have used this for uh, standard light water reactors, uh, FHRs. Um, gas cool fast reactors. Pretty much everything you can imagine we have used it for. It was the original purpose, non-traditional reactor, so you can do that. Um, as a flexible code, uh, it also requires some commitment, meaning it's not an easy tool. It has a lot of options, meaning uh, you need some time to get 
used to those options and to understand the tool. And in general, when you speak about multi-physics, it is complicated by nature. It means you have to understand thermal hydraulics, neutronics, in some cases thermal mechanics, the coupling of the two. And since this is based on a CFD tool, you have to be relatively familiar with CFD. If you want to be proficient with that, you will have to know what is a wall function. So you have to have some familiarity with CFD. Um, these are what we already presented to you on Monday. I'm just, you know, um, giving it a gen form flavor. Uh, so when you have a reactor, um, you typically have at least three different physics that you want to investigate. And I'm simplifying because there is more than that. But there is at least neutronics, then the fluid dynamics, thermal hydraulics of the coolant, and there are the solid structures. Sometimes we forget about solid structure because they do not enter the safety analysis. Sometimes you cannot. Typically in fast reactors, the deformations are very important because they are the main uh, feedback for the activity. Um, for instance, when you do neutronics, you may want to, uh, oh, Neutronics, coolant, and solid, you may want to have one mesh or multiple meshes. It's a choice. It's not obvious. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. What we did for gen foam is we want to have three different meshes. In, gen, in open foam language, this is called multi-region. <coughs> in open foam, you usually speak about regions, not meshes. <coughs> we have one mesh for neutronics, one for fluids, and one for solid. And of course, you have to have different fields, and each field is solved on one specific mesh. But something you have to be aware of is that when you have fields in one region that you're solving and you want to couple this region with the other one, those same coupling fields will have to live on two different meshes. For instance, temperature. You solve it in coolant, but neutronic needs it for uh, parameter parameterization of cross-sections, right? So if you have a field that is created in fluid, that field will, ha will have to be projected into the neutronics because the neutronics need to know what's the temperature in order to correctly parameterize the cross-section. So in multi-physics simulations, it's very normal if you see duplicated fields on different meshes. And you have to be aware that that field is solved in one mesh and used in another one. That is something that is important to keep in mind. That is part of understanding a tool, and it's important. Um, of course, each mesh has its own equations. Neutronics, you can have Newton transport, diffusion, you can have point kinetics. Um, in the coolant part, you can have RANS, you can have LES, you can have porous medium. Um, solid structure, you can have heat conduction, continuous mechanics. In gen form, what we have is that for neutronics, you can choose between diffusion, adjoint diffusion, sp3, sn, point kinetics. We can do precursor transport. This is something that we will see today in the MSFR exercise. When you have a liquid fuel reactor, you have to solve for the precursors that move around. They are not statically there. Uh, for thermal mechanics, for the moment, we have just a very simple linear elasticity because the main purpose was to simulate flowering and you don't get into a plastic behavior in these reactors. Um, for thermal hydraulics, we have quite a bit because we have one and two phase and we have both standard runs, CFD, and porous medium. And you can combine the two. Actually, you can combine the three. You can have Two phase, one phase, some components in porous medium, some components CFD, can do whatever you want. Um, for the two phase, we have validation for sodium. We are working on the validation for water. Uh, of course, it's always a preliminary validation. You know, if you want to do a commercial dedication, that is a whole different story. But we try to provide a tool that is good enough to do research and good enough to be taken by a company if they want to do a commercial dedication of it. Um, since you have three different meshes, regions, in gen form, the source code, the case folder, the control dig, 
they are different compared to a standard uh, open form case. Except for one, that is CHT multi-region. In open form there is one solver that is actually multi-region. It has actually multiple meshes. Um, so the case folder looks a lot like CHT multi-region. So instead of, you know, we told you that we have zero constant system. Do you remember from Monday, right? In Genform you will have zero, and within zero you will have neutral region, fluid region, thermomechanical region. Then you have constant, and within constant you will have fluid region, neutral region, thermomechanical region. So the whole thing is multiplied by three. Why? Because you need three sets of fields, three meshes, and three sets of numerical ways of solving things. So for every mesh you will need a FIV scheme and a VV solution, right? So it's multiplied by three, but it's not that strange. As I said, CHT multi-region has this structure. But that means there's a lot of inputs, you'll see. Um, typically you see this both in the source code where we divided things in neutronics, thermal, hydraulics, thermomechanics, in the case folder. In the control dict you will see new flags, right? Do you want to solve for energy? Yes, no. For fluid mechanics? Yes, no. For neutronics? Yes or no. And this is all uh, open form style, so you, different options are at runtime. You do not have to recompile your tool if you want to solve for only neutronics. You just have to decide before the simulation, do I want to solve for neutronics or couple neutronics, thermal hydraulics, this kind of things. You don't need to recompile every time. Open form is a very clever runtime selection uh, mechanism that allows you to do that. Something you may wonder, why three different meshes? What's the reasoning behind? Well, the reasoning is that doing mesh-to-mesh -mesh projections is not that computationally expensive, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you may want to have different refinements. You may figure out, you may realize that in your case, you need a finer mesh for neutronics than for thermal hydraulics, or the opposite. If you have one mesh, you are forced to use the finest mesh for all the physics. And you don't want that, right? Because you're just wasting computational time. Probably what is even more important, imagine you have a, this is a very simplified 2D uh, model of the FFTF, sodium fast reactor. It's a mixed pool uh, loop type. And, you know, you want to solve for thermal hydraulics, you want to solve it for the pool and for the uh, pipes and for the, at least part of the secondary circuit. You're always going to need a big mesh. And does it make sense to solve neutronics here? Uh, probably not, right? So you may want to have a mesh for neutronics that is, in fact, much, much smaller than the mesh for thermal hydraulics. So much more flexible, a bit more complicated for the person who does the programming, but we believe it was worth it. How do we do the coupling? Um, operator splitting or uh, segregated solver, you will hear different ways of saying the same thing. It means we solve one equation at a time and we solve through iteration. Does it mean it's not implicit? Uh, or it's not tightly coupled. No, it is tightly coupled. It's just you need to iterate. Depending on how much you iterate, you can get more or less uh, accuracy. I tend to say that GenFoam is semi-implicit, and there is one reason for that. It's a bit of a technicality, but um, the CFD part, for the CFD part, we, stand, we follow a standard approach. We follow what is called the pimple loop, uh, Stefano mentioned that. I will not explain here. I don't have time for that to explain what the pimple loop. Uh, I think ChatGPT can give you a good answer. Um, but in general, when we solve, historically, when we solve CFD, we don't do fully implicit. Um, the reason is that people have found out that operator splitting is better and that you normally do not need to iterate at every iteration to get full convergence. Usually you iterate two, three times, four, five. Uh, so you get to a semi-implicit solution, and uh, it's not open form. Uh, the same exact algorithm is in open form, in ANSYS, in star CCM. A solution for CFD is normally semi-implicit. And so the, that, that part of GenFOAM is semi-implicit. The rest, the neutronics, the thermal mechanics, you can iterate it as much as you want and make it implicit. Um, 
that's what I just said. It was just a snippet of the code in case you are curious to look at it, but this is something I'll let you look at uh, later if you want. <coughs> now, if you look at the case folder, as I said before, you will have, um, for instance, in system, you will have fluid region, neutral region, thermomechanical region. So in every region, you will have a FIV solution. That FIV solution will govern that specific physics. Um, you will also have a FIV solution on the upper level, just in the system folder. Why? Well, because it's a multi-physics thing and you have to decide things that per pertains all the physics. So things like, do you want a tightly coupled solution, yes or no? That is not a flag that can be put inside fluid region, neutral region, or thermomechanical region. This is a choice of the overall simulation. So within the case folder, I'll show you later, uh, you enter into system. Inside system, you will, also, you will already have a FIV solution and a FIV scheme. But then you will also have a neutral region, and inside the neutral region, you will have another FIV solution and another FIV schemes. So you will have FIV solution, FIV schemes for the single physics, and one that is general for all the physics that is on top. So if you find a lot of FIV solution, FIV schemes, think about the logic behind. Um, something about the thermal hydraulics, because <clears throat> I tend to find out that people tend to be a bit confused about the porous medium approach. So I prefer to give you some explanation about it. Um, I mentioned it briefly last time, but th the basic idea is when you have a s tool like open form or Moose that is based on the idea of solving PDEs on a general mesh, the very natural way of doing CFD, <coughs> of doing thermal hydraulics for nuclear reactors is porous medium. <coughs> the reason is that porous mediums are the same equations, as I said last time, as CFD, <coughs> with the addition of a couple of terms. A porosity and subscale interaction given by pressure drops and heat transfer, pretty much. And the nice thing about porous medium is that you can treat, I mean, this is, a so, again, a sodium fast reactor. You can treat, you know, things in a reactor and in a heat exchanger using a porous medium approach, and you can easily transition to standard CFD in the pools. Um, if you go back 10 years, this was not obvious. If you go back 10 years, you look at the research that was done 10 years ago, people were trying to couple system codes or subchannel codes in the code with commercial or free CFD tool, with external interfaces, there was a lot of problem of numerical stability, of numerical diffusion. Uh, being able to transition within the same mesh from porous medium-like or sub-channel-like solution to pool CFD solution is something that is very convenient if you want to simulate things like a sodium fast reactor, or if you want to simulate things like in a LWR boron injection from the primary, um, from the cold leg. <clears throat> and the nice thing about porous medium is that, again, uh, you can turn it into a semi-system tool-like approach where you use correlations for pressure drops and heat transfer instead of solving for CFD. Porous medium is born, to give you some, a, minim, a little bit of a theory behind, when to get porous medium, what you do is you start from standard conservation equations, Navier-Stokes equations for momentum, energy, and um, mass. You take your heterogeneous geometry, imagine pins and channels. You create control volumes. You do a volume average uh, that uh, smears your um, structure. So you end up with a mesh where your structure has disappeared. And uh, you can imagine that if the structure disappeared, you need to have in your equations new um, terms that describe that structure. Because it's not there anymore, but physically it is there, right? So you have to have something that describes it. And the two things that describes it is the porosity and, once again, 
a term that describes the interaction. So if you do this volume averaging on the momentum equation, you will have a porosity somewhere in your equation and you will have a source that is a momentum sink, actually, that describes the fact that your fluid is losing momentum due to interaction with the structure. Can you imagine how you model that pressure drops with correlations? The same as we do in trace, the same as we do for sub-channel codes. You need correlations. Um, these are the sets of the three equations, right? So we have mass, momentum, energy, and each time you will end up with additional porosity and with an additional momentum. Uh, sorry, an additional source. A momentum source, an energy source, or a mass source. Mass source, most of the time, doesn't make sense because you don't lose mass in your structure to the fluid unless you're <coughs> modeling chemistry. But these are very general equations. You may imagine that you have, uh, you know, the solid phase is one phase. You may have solid phase, liquid phase, and another liquid phase. That is called two-phase flow, right? So if you all of a sudden have two phases, you will also need a mass transfer between phases. So and these are very general equations that you can apply to porous medium, single phase flow, two phase flow, multi-phase flow if you want. Um, again, uh, if we simplify the things, so these were very general equation for any number of phases. If you stick to single phase, these are the equations that you will see. And if you look at them, this is standard Navier-Stokes with the addition of a porosity and moment source terms. One that describes the momentum exchange between the subscale structure and the fluid, and one that describes the energy exchange between the subscale structure and the fluid. How do you s model this? You can do the old derivation. I will not do it here. You can prove that you can use standard pressure drops correlation to model um, the pressure drops in the momentum equations, and that you can use standard Nusen number correlations to model the energy exchange between your fluid and your structure. Structure, imagine the pins in the reactor, imagine the fuel. How do you take trace or take a system code? How do you model uh, the heat transfer between the pins and the fluid? You use correlations. Ditus Bolter, for instance, right? Uh, or Reme if you're doing fast reactors. Same exact thing in, in gen form. If you want to do porous medium, you will need uh, correlation for pressure drops, correlation for Nusel number. A little bit of a difference in gen form, you can do 3D because it's a 3D solver. So in principle, if you want, you can give three different, set, three different sets of correlations for the three different directions. Does that make sense? Well, in principle, yes, because pressure drop along a bundle is not the same as a pressure drop across a bundle, right? You may have to have different correlations, which is something typically was not possible in system tools, which is one of the reasons why we develop things like GenFoam. Uh, it's because sometimes we need to model things that are not so standard, and you may want to have a different correlations in two different directions of the fluid. Does that make sense to you? Or less? Yeah? So typically, when you get into uh, GenFoam, you look at um, the various dictionaries, same logic as OpenFOAM. You have dictionaries where you throw in uh, physical properties and correlations. When you look at fluid, you will find one dictionary that is very long. It's the, most, the more complex you will find in GenFOAM. It's called phase properties. It includes all the properties of the porous medium simulation. It will have things like regime maps, it will have things like drug models. It will have things like heat transfer models. And the reason is what I just explained to you, is that you need to simulate pressure drops of your fluid and the heat transfer of your fluid, for instance, with the uh, fuel. Um, we will not look uh, today at the regime maps because of the time we have, but if you are familiar with system codes, you know that you can have different correlations depending on where you are. The easiest is single phase. You can be laminar or you can be turbulent. If you're laminar, you will have a set of correlations for heat transfer 
um, and pressure drops. If you're turbulent, you will have another one. Typically, Nussel number for laminar flow, constant around four, three point something, if I remember correctly. Nussel number for uh, turbulent flow, Reme, Ditus, Bölter, those kind of correlations. And you can give it. Uh, you can either use correlations that we created and you can just call them at runtime. Or if you realize that eh, I'm missing a correlation, we have possibility to give a correlation as a simple A multiplied to the Reynolds to the sum to an exponent, prime to an exponent plus a constant, and you can decide all the exponents. Or you can learn how to program in open form and create your own correlations. Creating correlations is very easy. It's one file. You copy paste and you will have you change the thing and you will have a runtime selectable new model for GenFOAM. This is the magic of object-oriented programming. It can be very easy to extend the code. Um, something you should be aware of, you know, we are focusing a lot on the fluid and the question is what happens to the structure because the poor structure, we smeared it out and it's not there anymore. But we may want to have it, right? If we are doing uh, an LWR, we may want to have a decent solution of your temperature field inside the pin. But we don't have a pin anymore. How do you do that? You create a subscale model. You say, okay, for each cell, I assume that one pin is there, and I calculate the temperature in the pin knowing what? The temperature of the coolant, the heat transfer coefficient between the coolant and the pin, and the power. The power will come some from somewhere. You can impose it or it will come from neutronics. But once you have that information, you can solve for the temperature field inside your pin. It can be an electrically heated pin, it can be a nuclear pin, it can be a plate, it can be whatever you want. We have a certain number of subscale structure that we have prepared in GenFOAM, or you can create your own. As usual, this is the good thing about OpenFOAM, you can customize. Um, we have two types of structures in GenFOAM. If you want to understand the reason, think about fast reactors. Fast reactors, you have your coolant, you have your fuel, and you have wrappers around your assemblies, right? Um, the fuel is a structure, it's an active structure. We call it a power model. But we also have the wrapper that is simply a passive structure that is heated or cooled, or cooled based on the coolant. It's actually following the coolant with some delay. It creates an um, energy sink, if you want, or an inertia in what happens in the core. And it can be important to model it. So we have the options on having a passive structure, which can be your um, wrapper, for instance, or an active end, or an active structure that can be, for instance, the fuel. So you have this double option. Again, uh, if you need to have a subscale structure, it means that somewhere in GenFOAM, you will find something to define a, a power model or an active structure or a passive structure. And here is an example. This is the example, well, it's actually an example for something we will do today. Um, you will find things like heat exchangers with a power model that is a fixed temperature, or you will find more complicated things like power model that is of type nuclear fuel pin. And if you need to have a nuclear fuel pin, you need to define inner radius, outer radius, cladding, uh, material, H, uh, gap conductance, everything that you need to simulate a pin. And here you start realizing the complexity of multiphysics. It's a lot of parameters, but we cannot give these parameters as default. This is something the user has to define. So if you, you know, start using a tool like this and you realize it's very complicated, well, you have to understand that the physics behind is complicated. It's a lot of things that happen in a reactor. Something I mentioned before, just for your, you know, some of you is curious about that. I said porous, I said it last time, porous medium is a generalized version of subscale. It's not me saying that. It's written black and white on the Kazimi, Todras Kazimi uh, book. You can derive it. The thing is, you can, when you do porous medium, you can separate, for instance, your assembly into different regions. 
and give different sets of correlations to, the, to each region. If you start having different set of correlations to different regions and you start having a mesh that follows the same structure as an assembly, you end up exactly in the same situation as a subchannel code. So you can exactly replicate the results of subchannel code. It's a very tedious work if you want to do that, but it's possible. You just have to provide the same set of correlations that the subchannel sub code uses for the various regions. These are just examples on how you can use this mixed porous medium subscale structure thing. Um, this is a poor, pure coarse mesh. Uh, you take an assembly, you forget that you have pins inside. You simulate it with 24 triangles and then you use a subscale structure or two, one active, one passive, one that simulates your fuel, one that simulates your, clad, your wrapper. You are pretty much done. Or if you want to simulate an entire primary circuit, you can try to do something a bit more complex. You can mix the two things. You can say, okay, inside the core, I want to have my fuel and I want to have my correlations for pressure drops and heat transfer. Then I go into the pools and all of a sudden I have no structure anymore. Automatically, uh, GenFoam will revert back to standard CFD. We don't need to tell GenFoam. As soon as GenFoam sees porosity zero, or sorry, porosity one, it goes back to standard runs CFD simulation. So you can set up this and just say, okay, I set up my mesh, I, in the face properties I give porosity different than one and I give some pressure drops correlation, some models for the fuel in the core, in the heat exchanger, in the pumps, and you will automatically have a porous medium simulation for those components and the runs CFD simulation for the rest. You can also do fancy things like having a secondary circuit with uh, heat, um, heat exchanger model. It's a bit of an advanced um, capability that we are actually now abandoning because we found a smarter way to simulate a secondary circuit using Modelica. But this is for another time. We have two-phase flow, just for your curiosity. We'll not touch two-phase flow. This is a mess, it's complicated, it's very difficult to converge. Um, just for you to know, if you need to do two-phase flow, uh, for sodium is there, for water is almost there. We need to add last few things, make sure that everything works. Um, for neutronics, I already mentioned, we have a certain number of tools, diffusion, joint diffusion, and so on. This is just for you, for your curiosity to know what it means to do. Well, it's actually more than curiosity because we will use it later today. What it means to do uh, precursors in liquid fuel. Um, when you do precursors equations in a standard reactor, you have a derivative over time, you have production from fission, and you have decay. When you have a liquid fuel reactor, you have to add a divergent and an ablation. You have to add a convective term because these precursors are convected by your velocity and you need the Laplacian because this um, precursor can diffuse because they are in a liquid, they can diffuse. And the diffusion is not negligible, uh, especially if you're in a turbulent flow. The part about diffusion can change the reactivity of your reactor quite significantly. So this is a question I usually get. Is diffusion worth modeling for precursors? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it can be important. Um, a bit too much. You know, once again, this slide you can use when today you will want to use GenFoam if ever to understand how to set dimensionality boundary condition, which boundary conditions are available. As usual in open form, remember your mesh is always three dimensional. You want to do 1D or 2D, you have to use specific boundary conditions like empty boundary condition or wedge boundary conditions for axis symmetric. Um, of course, if you want to solve for neutronics, you will have to decide that you want to solve for neutronics. How do you do that? You can imagine there is something in the control dict, because there is always something in the control dict. And what's, you can, what's in the control dict is there essentially a flag, two flags. One is not here. One that will tell you, 
do I need to solve for neutronics? True, false. You look at the control, you'll see it. And another one that it's going to tell you, is this a liquid fuel reactor or not? Why is it in the control dict and not specific to neutronics? Well, because the fact that you have a liquid fuel reactor affects everything. It's not just about moving precursors around. It also goes into how do I generate power in fluids? Because if you have a solid fuel reactor, your power will go to the pin that will go to the coolant. If you have a liquid fuel reactor, you have a shortcut. Your power goes directly into the fluid. So you have to have an option that is a global option that says, okay, this reactor is liquid fuel. You will find it in the dictionary, in the control dict. And then you will have within neutronics, you will have a dictionary called neutronics properties where you can choose things. If you want to solve for diffusion, SN, SP3, point kinetics, that's where you define it. This is very open form logic. In open form, imagine you're doing standard uh, pimple form, and you want to decide whether you want to do RAS, RANS, LES. Where do you find it? Inside constant, inside the dictionary, that is called thermophysical properties. For neutronics, in gen form, you will find it in constant, neutral region, neutronics properties. It's all according to the open form logic, and in there you will find two options. Which model? And here you can use the banana method. So if you do not know how to, sorry, if you do not know how to call it, write whatever you want in there, write it wrong. Genform will tell you, I do not know the banana model for neutronics. What you can use is SN neutronics, diffusion neutronics, point kinetics, and so on. It will give you the options. Um, eigenvalue, true or false. Eigenvalue. Those of you who are not super familiar with neutronics essentially means get it as a steady state. It means you're solving for a steady state solution for the neutron transport equation. All right. It's a bit slightly more complicated than that, but it's pretty much what we do in the end. If you set it to false, it means you're assuming that your simulation is a transient simulation. Okay? Um, thermal mechanics, I'll skip it because it's too much. Um, I wanted to give you some examples, just to give you an idea of what you can do. As I said before, you can do two-phase flow uh, in one channel, in a core. It's very computationally expensive, very painful to set up. You can do more fun things like um, flowering of a reactor. You can do discrete ordinance. This is the discrete ordinance model of the Crocus reactor that we have in Switzerland, or they have in Switzerland, I'm not there anymore. I can do molten salt reactors, and this is what we will do today, because it's a fun um, reactor to study. How much time do I have? 40 minutes? Um, this is something we already covered um, last time. Same exact thing. Um, about how much computational power do you need. This is almost exactly the same slides as Monday, so I will not go through it. I will now go through uh, another presentation. It is about um, gen form in practice. Um, while I transition, do you have questions? I just have to unshare and share again. Yeah, um, so they're asking me the difference between eigenvalue and uh, transient. Um, an eigenvalue solution in neutronics is a solution where you essentially, in simple terms, you essentially try to adapt your K-effective so that you get to a steady state. 
may seem strange, but you know, the k effective is that in, in your diffusion equation, the k effective you can put it at the de denominator of your uh, production term. So essentially, you adjust the production term till you get to a steady state, meaning to get to a critical state. It seems strange, but right? Because you're saying I'm changing the k effective to get to k effective one. But that's what we do. We actually modify the k effective so that there is a balance, right? So essentially, you're getting to a steady state. You're forcing your reactor to be, uh, sorry, to be in uh, a critical state, in an equilibrium state. Transients, you say, okay, I, I have whatever k in that parameter. I fix it. I put a time derivative in the equation, and I let it go. So you go from a, an equation where you do not have a time derivative and where you iterate so that you have a certain power and a certain, well, you're essentially searching for your first Hagen vector to a case where you say, I'm simply solving in time a diffusion equation. Does that make sense? You don't, think, you don't have to think about when we do this kind of calculations, and this is not just GenFOM, it's in general, uh, when we do transient analysis with uh, deterministic tools. Um, we do not try to change our cross-sections to be critical. This would be a very complicated process, right? So what we do is that we use an equation where we have our own cross-sections and we add a parameter, which is the k effective. And that parameter appears at the denominator of the production term. It appears as a, uh, modifications to the nu sigma, uh, nu sigma f, right? So we are implicitly, when we try to search for an eigenvalue, it is as if we were modifying our fission cross-section so that the equation is balanced, so that production equal um, abs absorption plus leakage, right? Um, this is kind of an intuitive way to explain what the k-effective is. Mathematically speaking, the k-effective is an Eigen uh, value. So you can see it the mathematical way or the physical way, yeah? And so basically when you do Eigen value, you just say, okay, yeah. now this is important because we will bump into it in the, in the exercise later. So you, when you do eigenvalue, imagine that you have your equation and you take away the time derivative and you start adjusting your k-effective till production equal leakage plus uh, absorption. At that point you have a k, which is actually the k-effective, that balances your equation. Then if you want to do a transient from that point, what you do is you keep the k that you had found, because this is the k that is balancing your equation. If you want to do a transient, you want to start from a steady state. Because if you start from something that is unbalanced, you are starting from, you're essentially creating a reactivity step. So you basically you keep that k so that your equation is balanced, and from there, you can run a transient as if you were starting from a steady state. And the transient, well, the transient is the simplest thing. It's just you have a derivative over time uh, of <coughs> equal to Laplacian plus production, and you're simply solving the time-dependent diffusion equation. But the k part is tricky. It's always confusing because well, also how we present it very often in some books is presented in a very mathematical way as an eigenvalue of an eigenvalue problem. Um, from a physical perspective, they tell you that k effective is a balance, and then you look into how we use it in deterministic codes, and it feels like we use it uh, to trick the equations. Actually, it all, it's all the same. It's just three different ways of looking at the same thing. That makes sense? Okay. Nope. Um, so when you have the neutron transport equation, you can solve it according to several different approximations. Uh, if you look at deterministic methods, there are a number of them. And uh, what we have in GenFOM, the SN discrete ordinate method, 
is the highest accuracy that we have is a method where you distinguish between energy groups and angles. Um, diffusion is uh, a method where you assume um, that there is the, the flux is isotropic. You don't have difference in angles. You're just assuming uh, isotropic flux, and it's the easiest method that we use. So it's alternative. It's either diffusion or SN. SN is kind of a technical name for discrete ordinates. No, no, we just have a power iteration, we just get the uh, uh, first harmonic. It shouldn't be difficult to modify the code to, the code to get the, higher, the other harmonics, but it's not implemented now. Yeah, this is a, a standard open form capability. So you just have, you know, when you create an application in open form, you inherit all the capabilities of open form, which means, for instance, you can do a time-dependent fixed uh, flux uh, boundary condition. Um, you can use every capability that open form already has, which is very powerful. This is one of the things you get out of uh, using open form as a base library. I also have a question. Yeah. Is how do you model with this porous media approach, I would say, to simulate? How do you mo model the wire, uh, wire rapid pins? And can you obtain these secondary flows? Uh, no. So what we do is the same as uh, yes and no. I'm sorry. No, it was a wrong answer. Um, it's in between, uh, meaning, well, we model pressure drops using correlations, right? Um, can you get the secondary flow? Um, I know that there are people that are trying to get that. We cannot do that in gen form because that implies you can create that uh, secondary flow in principle because what you need to create is a momentum source. Uh, in a specific direction and add it. Yeah, you need to create an anisotropic. It's very complicated. Uh, it is feasible, but it requires modifying a little bit the code. Uh, I mean, implementing an anisotropic uh, momentum sink or source, uh, it's something you can do. It's in the capabilities of open form in general. It's not implemented in gen form. I may assume it's not an obvious, uh, it's probably a full PhD. So not, you cannot do it, or probably more, yeah. yeah. So I will just uh, move forward because otherwise I will not get to the end of what I want to present to you. I wanted to give you, you know, some um, introduction how to use the code. Again, this is much longer than what I can present today and there is one reason is that I this is filled with references and keywords that can make your life much easier in the future if you want to approach gen form. Uh, so it's almost a user manual, almost. So don't get frustrated if I don't present all the slides. This is for your benefit. Something important about approaching gen form. What you can do, you can download it and start modeling nuclear reactor. Wrong. Always learn open form. If you try to go straight to gen form, you will enter, trust me, I've seen it in many cases, you will enter an endless loop of frustration. Go step by step. When you are comfortable with open form, when you feel like I master open form, then you transition to gen form. If you try gen form straight away, it's a lot to take all of a sudden. And you may feel like nothing is working, and then, then you simply don't know that the problem was a CFD problem and then you think that it might be neutronics or the fluid or the structures and there's so many parameters that it becomes very difficult to master it and to handle it and it can be very daunting. So my suggestion is always try to go step by step. Start from understanding CFD, start from understanding open form. Once you are there, go to gen form. Unless you have a problem that is very similar to a tutorial. In that case, you can skip some of the steps but the basic suggestion is try to go step by step. In the end, it will feel like slow. 
in the end you will spare a lot of time. This is something we already pre presented and I keep it there so that it's easy for you in the future for your reference. Uh, learn open form, you can use the user guide, tutorial guide, there is a wiki, there is this very nice three week series um, tutorial, um, there is the source code guide, uh, there are lectures on YouTube. This one is a very, very good lecture uh, from Yazak, which I believe I wrote wrong. There is an extra C in there. Uh, but this is like in one hour, one and a half hour gives you a very nice introduction to finite volumes. Again, this presentation for Wolf Dynamics are very, very well done. Um, again, I will repeat it. We already said it. With open form, there is always a way out. You may feel it's not working. It does work. It's just you will need to find a way to do it. That's the nice thing of open source and of open source when it's nicely written. You will understand the source code. You will understand where the problem is. Don't get discouraged. The entry barrier may seem steep because there's CFD, there is Linux, if you're not familiar with Linux, there is uh, using meshing tools, post-processing tools, all of a sudden it, it's a lot to take. But you will learn a lot of skills that are very transferable to anything else. If you learn how to use OpenFOAM, it's going to be super easy to use StarCCM, it's going to be super easy to use Parks, it's going to be super easy to use pretty much anything else. And the nice thing is that you will have access to the source code and you will be able to understand which equations are solved. It's not going to be a black box. This is, for learning purposes, this is probably the best thing you can do. Open form or any other open source tool. It's not an advertisement to open form, it's advertisement to open source in general. Um, some additional background compared to just knowing open form. I mentioned before we used three different meshes. This means that we, as I said before, you're gonna have three different sets of folders in zero, in constant, in system. This is something you have to always keep in mind. So in a case folder, instead of having case, zero fields, constant uh, dictionaries, system dictionaries, you will have zero, neutral region with its own fields, fluid region with its own fields, thermomechanical region fields. And inside constants, you will have neutral region with its own dictionaries, fluid region with its own dictionaries. It's a lot, a lot of dictionaries. Welcome to multi-physics. Second little piece of information that I think you asked me, it was about multi-material. Um, of course, if you do nuclear reactors, you need that. Why? Imagine you're doing neutronics and you have a core and a reflector. Well, you need two different sets of cross-sections for your core and for the reflector. So you need this kind of multi-material capabilities, which is available in open form, not often used in the standard open form applications. So if you become very familiar with open form and then you start using gen form and you may get into the situation, what are cell zones and materials? And this is the reason why I added this slide. So in principle, in open form, you are allowed to add what we call cell zones. Um, in every mesh generation tool has its its own name for this thing. Sometimes they're called physical volumes. I think Salome called it physical volumes. Gmesh probably calls it materials. I'm not sure. Um, and I'm sure ANSYS and StarCCM, they have names for creating different materials. But the underlying thing, and if you could open you know, the mesh format of ANSYS, you will see it. The basic idea, you simply, for every cell, you add a label. You just say, okay, for this cell, it's not just a number of faces and uh, points that define the cell, it's also a name that can be fuel, can be cladding, can be reflector, can be graphite, can be anything, it's just a name. And cell zone in, gen in open form is just a way to give a name to a set of cells. And this is the same approach that you will find in any mesh. Yeah, it's called cell zone, sometimes called material, sometimes it's called something else. It's always the same thing. Um, now imagine you have a mesh, and imagine you have a mesh where you have a core and a reflector. And you call them literally core and reflector. And then you may wonder, how do I assign different cross-sections to the different 
materials. How do I say which cross section to the core and with which cross sections to the uh, reflector? You can imagine that you will have a dictionary somewhere that associates a certain set of cross sections to the name core or to the cell zone core, and other cross section to the cell zone uh, reflector. This is the same approach that you will find in any multi-material uh, solver in open form. This is not a gen form thing. You will find the same thing in offbit. You will likely find the same thing in containment form if they have different materials. You will find the same thing now in open form because now they have introduced a multi-zone thermophysical properties. So it's always the same logic. So you will find, for instance, in open form, in gen form, within constant, within neutron, region, you will find a nuclear data file. And the nuclear data file, you will have zones that are divided, for instance, into control roads, core, reflector, and for each zone, you give a different set of cross-sections. Think about the logic. There's no other way, right? You create, you gave a name to cells, and now you have to say to the solver, look, to that name, I want to associate a certain set of cross-sections. Or a certain conductivity if you're doing uh, heat conduction or a certain uh, set of thermomechanical properties if you're doing thermomechanics. You need to be able to associate different properties to different cell zones. Um, how does that work? As I said, all mesh generators allows for the option to generate cell zones. They're called different ways. So yeah, here I write it. They're called physical volumes in Gmesh and they are called groups in Salon. And I have no idea how they are called in uh, other tools, but I guess every tool has its own name. But then when you do the mesh conversion, so you do mesh to foam, magically you will have a mesh with cell zones. Most of the time, depending on which tool you're using for the conversion. But open foam comes with a set of uh, routines for converting meshes to open foam format. If you look into the case folder, you saw last time the mesh is inside a folder that's called polymesh. If you open polymesh and you have created cell zones, you will see that there is another uh, file that is called cell zones. Simple as that. And that file, I don't have it here unfortunately, is going to look like this. It's going to be, sorry, I'm lost. It's going to be a file where you have, for instance, seven cell zone. The first one is called control road, and control road includes cells number 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. It's a very simple file where for each name you associate the label of each cell. Very transparent. That's the nice thing of open form. If you are have doubt, you enter the poly mesh, you look at things, you see there is something called cell zones, and if you have created seven cell zones, you will see a seven and seven group of cells with different names. So always think it's an open source thing. There is a way you can find out things are done. How do you get it? Uh, you go on Google, search for Genform, GitLab, you will find it. How do you download it? Well, GitLab allows you the possibility to download at the repository as a zip file. It's not forbidden, you can do that, you can download it that way. If I have to suggest to you an approach, start using Git. Git is a, a versioning tool. It may seem at the beginning of a PhD uh, an additional step in so many things that you have to learn. It's totally worth it. It will allow you to have a very well-ordered way of doing things because you can keep um, track of the versions of the tool if you modify it. You can keep track of versions of case files if you're modifying it. You can do a day-by-day -day thing or a milestone-by-milestone -milestone thing and you will have the history of everything you have done. And well, GitLab is based on Git and if you clone, you will get, if you literally type on your terminal on Linux, git clone, and you add the address that uh, GitLab will show you when you click on clone, so you will have git clone and then something like HTTPS something something something, this will 
clone, it will duplicate this repository into your computer. Now select an SS that you can download and use in a standard way. Git takes half a day to learn, or maybe one day to learn, and it's extremely useful. Um, when you look into um, GenFOM, since it's Git based, you have different version of it. We call them branches. Uh, there is a master branch that is the stable branch, and there is a develop branch that is the most updated one. So develop is what developer, as develop, we use to include new feature. Master is what we believe has been sufficiently tested to be considered a stable solution. So if you need advanced capabilities, you probably would need to get the develop branch. If you want to be absolutely sure that there are no, more or less sure that there are no mistakes in the code, you get the master branch. How to install? You download OpenFOAM, you already did it. You install OpenFOAM, you prepare the environment, you already did it, right? You remember that when you use OpenFOAM, even after installation, most of the time, you have to source your environment. Um, you have to source uh, the environmental variables to use OpenFOAM. And then you either download or git clone, clone GenFOAM. How many of you have GenFOAM already downloaded? Anyone? One? One? We will need to do that um, as soon as we can because it may take a while to install it. We will, what I suggest is that we try, before the coffee break we try to download the thing and that we let it run during the coffee break because even the compilation of GenFOAM is easy. It's a dot slash all w make. It takes a while. It's a big piece of code. Um, still have 15 minutes. So like in five minutes we will start doing this installation thing. So maybe you can start preparing your computer for that. Um, for visualization, you know, we use Paraview. Do you have Paraview on your computer now? How many of you? Can you raise your hands? Okay, there's going to be enough Paraview uh, for in, in every group. Um, what's inside? Inside GenFOAM, you will find documentation, the source code, documentation, the source code, some tools and a lot of tutorials. Um, documentation. Um, the most important one is the Doxygen based documentation. Um, I'll show it to you. If you go to the GitLab repository and you look at the readme file, there is a link to a Doxygen generated documentation. Doxygen is an automatic system that is able to read code and provide you with a well-ordered representation of that code, including for object-oriented things like dependencies of classes and uh, things that you may need the day you will start modifying the code. And this is what also OpenFOAM people do. In addition to that, since we know that GenFOAM is a complicated tool, we added Kind of a real documentation, like introduction, how to compile, pre-processing, running, post-processing, and a little bit of a user manual that includes neutronics, thermal hydraulics, thermal mechanics, coupling, time steppings, a list of tutorials and tips and tricks. It takes probably two hours to read this documentation. Uh, if you want to use GenFOAM, do that. It's going to be well spent time. It's not a large documentation, but it's going to give you hints that will spare you so much time afterwards. So go through the documentation. It's minimal. It's worth it. What we are doing now for every functionality that we have that is into a class, we are starting to add a description. For instance, if you have a correlation, in the header file, you will find the description of the correlation, where it comes from, how to use it. 
It's going to take a while to do that, but we have it for most of functionalities. So inside there, if you search, for instance, for albedo boundary condition, you will get a link that will give you, bring you to the page where you can look at the source code and you can look at the description of the thing and it can probably look at how to use it in GenForm. So we are trying, as many other people in the computational world, we are trying to go into a, a close merging of code and documentation for multiple reasons. Uh, one is that it's good that people that use the code understand that there is programming behind and that can look at the source code if they need and find it in a very straightforward way. It's also a way to make sure that documentation stays updated with code. This is a very basic best practice that was developed within the Encore initiative and that is well known outside the nuclear field is to try to always have a one-to-one -one between your code and your documentation. Um, I'll give you an example here. Imagine you want to use the REM correlation. You start typing in the REM, and then you will see that Doxygen suggests you some answers. You can click on the answers, and you will get uh, into a page that will explain to you things uh, about this correlation, where it comes from, what's the reference, and a link to the source code. You can look at the source code. Um, these are the additional pages I mentioned. Imagine you click on thermal hydraulics. You will end up in a page that explains to you what it is, how to use it, the subsolvers. You scroll down. You will find, for instance, explanation about the various dictionaries that you find in GenFOM, for instance, about turbulence properties. And inside, very often, you will find links to the source code. For instance, you click on poruscapsilon.h, it will bring you to a page where it tells you, look, this thing, this is, you know, for developers, it will tell you things, okay, this is things is derived from RANS model and from add viscosity. You will find a list of classes, of functionalities, of members of the class. And you click on more, and typically it will provide you an explanation. Uh, it will uh, tell you that it's very similar to the standard open form, but it's provided with an additional model. It will tell you how to use it. It will tell you that you will need to use these um, entries inside the Turbulence Properties Dictionary. So you will find uh, how to use things. So it's all linked together. You click on something, you end up in something that gives you the code, gives you how to use it. We are trying to go again in a direction where everything is integrated into the same uh, environment. Um, this is just an example um, about source code. When I say the source code tend to be quite transparent, uh, if you look into the code of the um, Nussel number correlation based on um, exponents and coefficients, you will find that um, what we are calculating is literally something like A plus B power Reynolds to the C power Prandtl to the D. This is as transparent as it is. Imagine you want to take this thing and you want to add a dependency over another parameter. You copy paste this thing, you add your parameter, you compile it, and all of a sudden you will have a new runtime selectable correlation for your uh, code. So this is the power of open source and object-oriented programming. When you start being a user, very quickly you become a developer, and you can develop things in a very simple way. Of course, this is a correlation. If you want to change the equations, yeah, it's going to be a bit more complicated. If you want to change the linear solver, it's going to be even more complicated. But it's all very layered, so it's easy to add the correlations, a bit more difficult to add new equations, a bit more difficult to change numerical schemes. Um, but you see the logic here, like it's a class. It's a class that is called Nusselt. It's a class that reads some constants from a dictionary and that uses these constants and gives it, gives it back to the equation. It's fairly transparent. And most of the time, for things that are not obvious, we include comments into the code. Um, 
Very often in the documentation, you will also find uh, links to the tutorials. This is important. Imagine you don't know how to use these turbulence properties. You, you know, you can go into the source code, this Doxygen, look at things, understand how it works. Or sometimes I can tell you, look, there is a tutorial where we use it. And you can run the tutorial and understand how it works. And you click on this, you will find yourself inside the dictionary that we use in that tutorial where we explain things. Like you will find this dictionary, you will find the porous capsulum properties for these regions, and you will find every parameter that is explained. You will find things like convergence length, and it will tell you that K and epsilon will exponentially converge in equilibrium according to this exponent. So you will find all the information you need. They are a bit spread out. Welcome to open source, but they are there. Um, again, the documentation is designed to promote understanding of the source code and integration of code use in development. Because integration of using and developing is the way you will get the most out of any open form solver. You can use it, but the day you become a developer, you will understand the power of this thing. You can do everything you want. You can add correlations, do research. You can use this tool to get to the state of the art and from there go beyond it. With your research, modifying the code. Uh, this is something that's very difficult to do with, or almost impossible to do with closed source tools. It's a black box. You cannot change it. Um, you can do applicative research. It's very difficult to do any development, right? Open source is the only way you can do that. Um, we'll not go into the source code. Uh, this is something I leave it there. I will distribute the slides after the course. Um, we'll not go through the tutorials because today we will essentially do a tutorial. Uh, what I would like to do in the... Um, I still have five minutes, right? Five to two, okay. What I would like to do is to try to... Uh, install, download and install GenFone. So, um, I can try to do that together. So let me un stop share and share my screen. Yeah. You have to have open phone. And you have to have open form 2306, which is the one we asked you to uh, install. Typically, uh, when you, well, I will show you. Yeah. So if you go on Google or whatever search engine you like and you search for GenFOAM GitLab, you should find it. It's under the Phone for Nuclear Project. You click on it and you will find <coughs> what I showed you before. You have the repository, right? Now, you have two ways of doing things, and I would suggest the clone way, and I will show you now how to do it. You go to clone, and you copy-paste the HTTPS link. You just have to click here, and it's going to be copy-pasted to your uh, computer, to your wallet. Are you all there? Okay, I don't know, how many of you are using Linux? How many, how many of you are using Linux directly? <coughs> and how many are using the Windows subsystem? Mac? One Mac. So I will not able to help you because I don't know how to use it and it's always a mess for me, but uh, we'll try to do it anyway. I think it's uh, pretty much you can open a terminal that is a Linux-like terminal, right, on Mac? Okay. 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 It's it's very random. Each time I do a workshop, uh, and there are people using Mac, there is always one for which it doesn't work. I don't know why. 
there is some dependency that misses. Huh? Okay, okay, it makes sense. I have zero experience with it, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm using uh, WSL, so I'm doing it the hard way. Um, if you're using WSL, you can open uh, a window, maybe, yeah. And you can go anywhere you want, actually. You can stay on home if you want. And you just do git clone, and you copy paste what you got from the website. Git clone HTTPS column slash slash. It, this is, you know, you can copy paste it from uh, GitLab. <coughs> Are you all there? Okay. You do it. Oh. Ah, it's because I already have it. Sorry. Let me do it somewhere else. Uh, okay, dear. Uh, test. You do it again, this time should work, unless you already had it, like in my case. It was just telling me, look, you already have it. It may take a surprisingly long time. <laughs> I assume we have a slow connection. Two megabytes per second, it's not gonna take a while. <coughs> Is this thing working for everybody? Anything, anyone that is having problem with this? You let me know, do not hesitate, don't be shy. Yeah, the connection is <laughs> surprisingly slow. It's okay, it gives us time to see if everything is working. In the meantime, do you remember that when you use OpenFOAM, you have to source? You know what it source means? Maybe not. We will do it, no worries. Let me open another uh, folder. Oh, uh, another terminal. Um, Okay, my download is completed. Are you all done? Is any, anyone still waiting for the download? It's done? Okay. So now, if you want to compile GenFOAM, you have to keep in mind that GenFOAM is an OpenFOAM application, which means you have to have OpenFOAM installed and the environmental variable of OpenFOAM loaded. How do you do that? This is something that you find typically on open form uh, manual installation instructions. You essentially have to do something like this, uh, source, and then you have to give a path to a file that contains the environmental variable of open form. Typically what we do is that we throw this thing to the bash RC so that you can use it using an alias each time. But you can simply, call, if you see, let me make it, let me see if I can make it bigger. I think there is a way, I just don't remember how. No, I think I can, oh, whoa. cool. Oh, it's very big. 
Do you see? So if you can type this thing. I can send it to chat. Good idea. Where's the chat? My computer. I don't see the chat. Uh, it should be up there, it's just a time. A control shift alt. Uh. Oh, yeah, I found it. Okay, for some reason, I cannot copy paste. Okay, it's on the chat now. Um, are we there? So once you have that, you just enter the folder. So CD GenFone. You look at what's inside and you realize again there is uh, everything that I said before. So, well, there is a copyright. So there's documentation, uh, the source code, which I should start calling source. Uh, there's the license, there's the readme file, tools and tutorials. You get into the source code, so you, you CD again into GenFOM, okay? So CD GenFOM and again CD GenFOM. You look inside and there is the source code. Um, um, I can, uh, Stefano? Can you take a look? Yes, there's no such file on the directory on the gen form. You did the git clone. And it didn't clone. Somebody else can see this. I would like just to run the thing because it takes 10 minutes to compile. It, it's really... It's so, once you're there, the only thing that is missing, once you are in the source, you just type dot slash all w make. If you want to make it quick, you add a J option. It just will do things in parallel, taking all the cores available on your machine. Now I do it, and if it doesn't work, I will be very sad. It will take a while. Um, I think we can try to solve things later. Hopefully, for most of you, it will have worked. Are, is it compiling? Is it compiling? Okay, so we, you can let it compile and we go for a coffee break. Yeah, okay. All let's, right. Let's take a coffee break, start compilation, and when we're back, it will be done. Download? Download? 
No, I did it from scratch and... Uh, No, però non ho fatto meno gesso. Come faccio a dire un po' di fondo? Per il primo, no, per il primo, per il primo esercizio. Non gli, non gli hai detto che è stazionario. Ah, non glielo dici? Simple Foam è una versione semplice. Puoi sempre utilizzare Pimple Foam per uno stage. Certo. Gli dai, gli dai il 